Okay, so thank you, good morning. So I'm going to tell you today a tale about heroes, about real world heroes, in fact. It's not the Avengers, but it also has a very nice twist at the end, so I suggest to stay sharp and, and pay attention, okay? And the tale starts right here, today, in this room, in which, as Carmen and Oscar told us at the beginning of the session, we are here together celebrating technology. We are here basking, rejoicing in the light of the next big thing that technology is going to amaze us with. But we are here also because some, maybe 25 years ago, several extraordinary people used technology to change the world. So let's try to get back all those years and, and take a trip down memory lane to try to see the world with their eyes back then at that time. So our first stop is 1994. So how many of you recognize this guy? hand raised. So this is Tim Berners-Lee, and the year, as I said, is 1994. Uh, this is before, of course, Google, before Netscape, before Mosaic, and maybe not even all of you know all of those names. Many of you would be playing with diapers back at this time or saying it in another way. Many of you were not old enough to, to, to know this guy. But he's Tim berners -Lee. this is 1994, and he's smiling right by his computer because he has just invented something great. He has just created the World Wide Web. So it all started very innocently. He was a scientist back at CERN, uh, the Swiss laboratory, laboratory, and he needed technology to exchange information, to share documentation with fellow scientists all over the world. The internet had just happened, had just been invented, but email was not enough, was not efficient enough because he needed to transfer huge amounts of data and the only solution back then was to take a physical device, download the information and transport it physically to another location. So hence, he invented the World Wide Web and he envisioned it as a place where everybody, all people, would be able to access the best information at any given time. In fact, he used to say this. He used to say that the goal of the web is to serve humanity. We, we build it now so that those who come to it later will be able to create things that we cannot ourselves imagine. That, that was his vision. That was what he knew from the very beginning when he created the web. And speaking of visions, let's move forward, fast forward one year. We are now in 1995, and we are seeing here one of the greatest visionaries of all time. So who recognizes this guy? I mean, this is back when he was movie star handsome, but it's Steve Jobs. And this is 1995. We are going to dedicate three minutes to listen to what he had to say about the web and about technology. And before starting making assumptions about how obvious everything that he's going to say is, and if you have been there, you, you would have guessed the same thing, just place yourself, yourself at a time where you had to access the internet through a fixed telephone line. There were no mobiles, and you had to endure an excruciatingly painful minute of sounds coming for a modem before hopefully being connected to a place where there were no search engines, no web portals, and no web industry whatsoever. And from that place, from that time, Steve Jobs tell us this. Oh, it's not here. That can dramatically yeah. amplify our innate human ability. And I believe that with every bone in my body, that, that of all the inventions of humans, the computer is going to rank near, if not at the top, as history unfolds and we look back. And it is the most awesome tool that we have ever invented. And, and I feel incredibly lucky to be at exactly the right place in Silicon Valley, at exactly the right time historically where this invention has, has taken form. And, and as you know, when, when you set a vector off in space, if you can 
change its direction a little bit at the beginning, it, it's dramatic when it gets a few miles out in space. I feel we've been, we, we are still really at the beginning of that vector. And if we can nudge it in the right directions, uh, it will be a much better thing uh, as, it, as it progresses on. And, and I look, you know, I think we've had a chance to do that a few times. And, uh, and it, it brings, I think, all of us associated with it tremendous satisfaction. But how do you know what's the right direction? You know, ultimately it comes down to taste. It comes down to taste. It's, it comes down to trying to expose yourself to the best things that humans have done and then try to bring those things in to what you're doing. And uh, so what's your vision of, you know, 10 years from now with this technology that you're, that you're developing? Well, you know, I think the internet and the web, the web is incredibly exciting because it is the, the fulfillment of a lot of our dreams that the computer would ultimately not be primarily a device for computation, but metamorphosize into a device for communication. And the, with the web, that's finally happening. So I think uh, that the web is going to be profound in what it does to our society. As you know, about 15% of the goods and services in the US are sold via catalogs or over the television. All that's going to go on the web and more. Billions and billions, soon tens of billions of dollars worth of goods and services are going to be sold on the web. If you could th a way to think about it is it is the ultimate direct to customer distribution channel. It, another way to think about it is the smallest company in the world can look as large as the largest company in the world on the web. So I guess um, I think the web, as we look back 10 years from now, the web is going to be the defining technology, the defining social, uh, um, the defining social moment for computing. And um, I think it's going to be huge. I think it's breathed a whole new generation of life into personal computing. And um, I think it's going to be huge. Yeah. Yeah. As an industry, the web is going to open a whole new door mm -hmm. to this industry. Yeah. It's another one of those things that it's obvious once it happens. But five years ago, who would have guessed? Right. That's right. Isn't this a wonderful place we live in? So you have to admire his clarity. His clarity both to see what was going to happen with the internet, with the web, and also to already see at the beginning of, of, of the whole technological disruption that it was very, very important to point it in the right direction because it would affect dramatically what would happen many, many years later. He said that he was trying to move it in the right direction. So that was his vision, that was his hope. And in fact, these guys really use technology to create magic, or at least the seeds of magic, at least kind of like eggs that would later produce, they thought they would produce wondrous technological creatures that would change the world, making it global, making it connected, making it, as Steve Jobs said, a wonderful place to live in. So, fast forward, 25 years later, we are back in this room, back today. How did they do? I mean, the vision that they had has come true. In a way, absolutely yes. I mean, today, their technology has fundamentally changed everything in our world, has changed the economy. I mean, if, if you see the interview, Steve just was mentioning, like, soon there will be dozens of billions of dollars, of dollars moving via e-commerce. And, for him, that was like an unimaginable number. Today, e-commerce is generating $3.3 million every 30 seconds. Just think about it. So in one day, the whole vision of Steve Jobs is realized every day. So it's, it goes beyond what, what he envisions. Same thing at the business level. I mean, we are all here coming from business. We know how business in the last decade or so have changed absolutely, have taken on a dramatic process of digital transformation, changing everything about them, from business, products, services, operation, procedures, 
even their culture, the, the, the offices themselves. It has been a huge change that has been at the core of all their strategic plans for the last decade or so. So yes, it has been trans tremendously transformative from a business point of view. Same thing socially, I, think, uh, I mean, I, I don't have to tell you about this, but just take a step back and try to look from a cold perspective these two numbers that I'm going to, to give you. First of all, there are more mobile subscriptions than people in the world. More subscriptions than people. And from all the people that are using these one point something subscriptions to connect to the internet, the average time that the user spends connected to the internet is six and a half hours a day. So I don't know about you, but the, the first time that I read this number, I thought it must be wrong. It, it's missing a zero or something. I, I cannot be contributing to this huge amount of time, which is the average of everybody who is using the internet. I thought that until I took my mobile phone and saw the report about the usage time. You can do it yourselves. It, all your phones bring it to you now. You will be first amazed and then scared of how much time you are spending only with your phone. And then you have to add on top of that desktop time, laptop time, everything. So yes, six and a half hours are spent online by every internet user every day. Socially, it has changed the world. So fundamentally, we can accept that technology has changed everything in our world, has changed work, communication, uh, shopping, banking, travel, education, even relationships. We meet people now over the internet. Families are created over the internet. It has radically, profoundly transformed our lives. That has been the effect of those, those eggs that we saw that produce technological magic. And the power that the technology has seems to be boundless, seems to be limitless. It's, uh, we, we are talking about rich power. You see here some numbers. Out of the whole population, I already have told you that more subscriptions than population, but 57 of the world population has its uh, active internet connections during the whole world. I mean, if you take the civilized parts, the US, Europe, etc., it goes almost to 100%. Same with active social media users, mobile social media users. I mean, the power that it has over people is undeniable. But it also has a power in terms of business, in terms of financials. If we take a look at the figures in terms of market capitalization of the top 100 companies, and we group them by sector, we will see, you see there, that technological companies lead the way by a huge margin. And that's without counting that many retail companies, financial companies, etc., can be considered now more or less a technological company. But even without that, only considering the Apples, Microsofts, etc., etc., technology leads the way by far. So in terms of financial and business power, also technological has power. Technology has power. In fact, it's probably the strongest power in the world right now, the strongest lever that we can move to achieve whatever we want to achieve. So, their vision came true. The, the eggs produced dragons, magical creatures, technological creatures that changed the world. It, they made possible what seemed impossible. So, uh, mission complete. Their vision ended in happy ending, right? Well, not so fast. First thing, let's see. Is the web really at the service of humanity? We can't really say this, because on top of all the good things, technology has also brought us a dark side that has also created a huge load of problems for humanity. For example, just reviewing some of them, there is a whole new generation with a new very serious problem of internet addiction. This is very serious, for example, in China. They have like 20-something million people diagnosed with internet addiction, and parents take them to some treatment centers like boot camps where they try to cure them from this illness so that they take back their lives. This is a very serious problem right now. Then we have the infamous thing about the appropriation of our data. We are all familiar with the Cambridge Analytica scandal. 87 million users had their data improperly accessed, and we know now that this was only the tip of the iceberg, and there are many more scandals because we simply didn't care about 
what we were to do with the data of our users. Or the fake news things. This is just a report from only last year in which Twitter has posted more than 10 million account, uh, tweets by accounts from Russia, Iran, etc. And this has all produced a phenomenon of, of its own, the, the dark phenomenon of the fake news, which for sure has changed our political ecosystems. I, I mean, we don't know if it really changed the results of the elections of the US in 2016 or, or the Brexit thing, but what we do know is that it had a profound influence in those processes. For example, this is data from the election of the US in which in a sample of tweets taken from the days of the election, half of them came from credible sources, but the other uh, half came from what we know now that were fake news sites. So yes, it's a problem and it's a global problem, but it gets worse because at least here in the Western world, it's only, and I quote, only a political problem. But if you go to Kenya, if you go to Sudan, these people here have no access to culture or have less access to culture than we have. But they do have access to mobile phones. Everybody here there has a mobile phone and they are listening all times to, they are exposed to this fake news and in some places is creating, like in this case, tribal genocide, fuel, fueling this, this hate with fake news. So in these cases, this is costing people their lives. So this is a serious problem. We cannot really say that the web is as the service of the humanity right now. But at least, can we say at least that technology has been used for good and has solved some of the problems of the world? So let's take a look around us, to, to the world that we live in. Are, are the main problems solved? Well, we cannot really say that also. We have 28,000 species which are on the verge on, uh, of extinction. We have marine life, which is barely sustainable each day that passes. We have global material footprint that is growing faster than the population rate of growth. So we are reaching 10 billion tons of material footprint. And we have the drama, the dramatic Think about the climate change. The average the earth temperature keeps rising and the average CO2 levels of emissions are way over the ones that we had before the industry era. And then we have very basic problems that have not been touched by technology. For example, this half of the world has no access to basic health services. So we cannot really say, and, and, and if you look at this as, as a whole, it's difficult to say why technology, being as powerful as it is, has not been able to change this, or at least to improve it. But the thing is that if we look at the vision that Tim Berners-Lee, that Steve Jobs had at the beginning, we can really say that the digital revolution, the technology revolution, was not created for this. I mean, in fact, I dare to say that the digital transformation revolution has been a failure for humankind, has not been what we all hope it could be at the beginning. That's a reality. So why? I mean, what went wrong? If, if we acknowledge that technology has such a transformative power, if we acknowledge that it's probably the stronger tool, the, stronger, the strongest lever that we have today to change things, what went wrong so that we could not have the vision that the, the creators had at the time? Well, I think it's very easy. The, the answer is very easy even if we don't like to see it or we don't want to see it. It's easy because we have been warned uh, from all of our lives, from uh, uh, dozens of dozens of stories and legends ingrained in our culture about the danger that we have fell right on. And you are sure, surely familiar with most of these tales. For example, we must not go farther than Game of Thrones. You can already see that I'm a fan of this series. I'm not going to spoil the ending for any of you that has not watched the final season, although you deserve it. But just, I will just say that this show goes around a character, a, uh, uh, the last of the Targaryens, that has at her reach an enormous power, the power of the dragons. And the whole show is to see if she is going to use it for good, if she is going to turn into a hero, or at the end, he will, she will succumb to his ancestors and become evil. But the, the thing is clear. There is a huge power that can be used for good 
are for bad. Very clear, very crystal clear. Same thing that in Star Wars. I don't have to tell you about the Star Wars. Everything revolves about the force, that enormous power, the heroes use it for good, and the villains of the story use it from the dark side to do their own evil things. Same with Mazinger Z. You will not all know these references, but it was like the Bible for many of us in our childhood. And there is a very famous quote by Professor Cabuto saying that Mazinger could be used for good or for bad. It could be a god or a devil. You have to choose what you use it for. And probably the quote that summarizes it all comes from Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. I mean, we knew that. In, in all these stories, we have perfectly clear in our minds that we have to cheer for the heroes and we have to criticize the villains. But the thing is that in real life, we have chosen the easy path. We have chosen the wrong path. We have chosen the path of all the villains in this story. That's the, that's the explanation. And many of you, I know that many of you I are, are right now thinking, okay, this is all very nice, but I don't have anything to do about this. You are talking about world huge problems, and I cannot do anything about them. So let me be very, very clear about this. I'm going to ask you, every one of you in this room, a single question. And I don't want you to raise hands or to answer it aloud. I just want you to, honest, to answer to yourself honestly. Uh, the, the question is this. Is this. Are you personally proud of what your company is doing or you within your company are doing with this enormous power that is technology? Are you using it to make the world a better place? Or are you using it for your own personal advantage, to advance in your company, to produce more profit for your investors, to, to, to reach one year more salary than the previous year? Or in summary, in other words, do you consider yourself the hero or the villain in your particular story? So just think about it. But think about it very, very hard, because now comes the time for heroes. Now is the time to step up, to step up. Because the digital revolution, the digital transformation, as we knew it, is dying, is living its last days, and is giving way to another revolution, which is the impact revolution. So digital transformation as we knew it, I mean, as a, as a headless race to conquest a space and be the first or be the second and, and, and isolate that space for you at any cost without any fear for, for consequences, that is living its last days. And the next revolution that has already started is the impact revolution, which we believe that will dominate the business landscape during the next decade or so. And in this new scenario, the companies that will prevail, the companies that will differentiate, are those who use technology to make a positive impact in the planet. There will be those that assume that success is no longer tolerable, tolerable at any rate. Okay? And this revolution is already starting, has already started, and has been driven by people, as every revolution in the world. The first one who united it were people. People, a new generation of people that really thinks that, that, that the companies should be responsible, their providers should be responsible for what they are doing. And have in mind that people are consumers, but are also workers, are also investors, and companies are paying attention to how these people think that companies should fight for social goods, goals, and would be more willing to buy their products and services if they were responsible. So, ignition by people. Then institutions are supporting in it. Uh, we, we were told at the beginning of the session about the, the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, which is drawing the path for every one of us, for companies, for governments, for regulations, for, for regulations, in order to achieve positive impact in the world. You have to get familiar with these uh, numbers, because these are the 17 goals that you will see more and more and more over the next months and years in every company, every project that you take on. So this support from the institution is also important. And although comes to companies that are following this path, these are only some examples, there are many more, 
of very big companies in Spain that have already integrated these objectives in their core strategic plans. Because it's, it's no longer enough to have an obscure department on the side, kind of like a re corporate responsible department, which has no budget, no impact whatsoever on the organization, just taking care of this. It should be in the, the, the strategic core of the company. Of course, the impact revolution must be grounded on purpose. I mean, it's, it's what we have been explaining the whole talk, and nobody explained it better than Maximus in Gladiator saying that what you do in life echoes in eternity. This should be the heart, the reason, the purpose of what you are doing. But moving to impact projects should not be seen as a burden or some cost that you have to pay to be good, it, because it will be a very big opportunity to grow, to create value, to be more profitable, actually. So where there are people, there are companies, and there are institutions pursuing something, money and profit will follow. And we are seeing it here, how the investment in impact activities is growing more and more during the years, and how companies that shift their strategic business toward impact-driven goals and projects not only will profit, but will be in the next years the only one to survive, the only ones that will differentiate from the rest, because the rest will no longer be able to compete with them. That's the thing about impact revolution. So, hopefully, if you are more or less intrigued by this and you want to give the first step in your company, in your area, yourself, to do things and start rejoining the revolution, you will have already think, thought, okay, I would like to, but I don't know even how to start. So, how do you start? Here comes, uh, let me introduce a little bit about Paradigma, uh, because we, we can help. I mean, Paradigma is a company that was created with a purpose. This purpose is written in our reception, in our hall, so that everybody sees when he comes into the company. It says the company doesn't matter. The company is the means to get extremely talented people working together to create exceptional things that make a better world. This has been our purpose from the very beginning, and, and we have been there from the very beginning. We shared the excitements of Steve Jobs and Tim Berners-Lee about a hopeful future. We have been first-line witnesses of the rise and fall of the digital revolution, and we have felt the sadness, the frustration, and even the guilt or, of not being able to be consequent with this purpose in, in the effect that the digital transformation is having in the world. So when the impact revolution started, we jumped with our, both our feet in, knowing, of course, that we cannot save the world on our own. But we can, and that's the challenge that we have set for ourselves, help to the brave companies that join the revolution to, to, to achieve their goals. Why? First, because I repeat, Technology, technology is the power, is the strongest power, the lever that can change everything. And we are very good in technology. And second, because we have been witnesses of the whole digital revolution. And the problems, the challenges that the companies are having to move to the impact of the revolution are similar. For example, we can generalize, and we do, we, we generalize them in four steps. Probably you will be uh, familiar with some of them. First, there are no dedicating teams in business units and day-to-day -day needs make it impossible to devote time to these projects. Hence, solution to create a framework to work to create the correct environment, the correct teams, the correct framework so that impact projects are generated, are the seeds of those projects are created. Second, even with the seeds, it's not easy to integrate these projects into the company's strategy and truly transform business. They can go in parallel tracks and not really be related with the heart of the company. Solution to bring a third P in the bottom line. It's what's called the, th the triple bottom line. Do not think only on profit and people, which is good. Think at a third company, at planning. We can help you to ideate, to, co to conceptualize your project so that they uh, compromise with this. Third, once the project is idea is conceptualized, it's difficult to establish impact and business KPIs that allow me to know if I'm being successful or not. Solution, drive those KPIs into your process. I mean, there are already studies, the, the studies, United Nations have done a very good work about it, but there are others that objectivize, that be, are very precise in terms of KPIs that I should achieve if I want to do impact projects. So 
bring them on into your process. And finally, and probably the, the, the last barrier of the chain, this is a hard data uh, from interviews by Ernst and Young. 88 of large companies, 30 percent of large companies say that they have social or environmental purpose, but only 6 percent declare that this purpose is well executed within the company. What is this saying to us? That we are past the stage of presentations, PowerPoints, a strategy. I mean, the purpose is very good, but we are already there. We need to move from purpose to reality. We need to make that happen. The technology is there. There are companies like us that are experts. There are groups, experts in everywhere. We know where we have to go. We just have to go. And in the execution is where many companies are being stopped right now. So we want to help to achieve these objectives. We, we want to bring experience of where, what other companies are doing, what is being done outside of Spain in the international arena. We want to help you prioritize your, your projects, your goals, so that we can achieve together a shift of the business from to, towards the impact-driven uh, in impact driven projects. That's what we want to do. And for that, we have like a path, a framework, in which we help our clients to go through all these three stages. Many are, or some of them are mature enough to jump into the second stage straightly, but normally we have to go through the three stages. First, an impact hub to help them to create a team and a structure. Then an impact lab to help them to ideate, to, to, to create the use cases that are going to generate impact. And finally, to create. When I have, once I have the ideas, I have to create those products, the impact guided agile. And at the end of the change, we will be able to actually really generate impact. So, some examples. I mean, I'm perfectly aware that many of you still are thinking, okay, yes, yes, but I'm not exactly sure that in my sector, in my company, in my, in my case, I'm not sure what could I do in terms of my autonomy that could really have an impact on the world. So let me just show, show you five, six, seven examples of things that, ideas that we are already moving in actual clients here in Spain so that maybe some of them inspire you in terms of what really can be done. For example, several sectors, different sectors, and retail. We are pushing using digital technology to give consumers the opportunity to have information about the impact of the products they buy, the products they consume. So you can use technology to know about everything that you are using, the social impact, environmental impact, economic impact, and play with that in order to force the consumer to, to compensate for the harm they are doing if they are doing any. This is a whole group of ideas. Also in retail, you can use artificial intelligence to reduce the carbon emission in transportation. This is something that is common to almost every company in retail, thanks to efficiency in logistics, space optimization, et cetera, et cetera. This is going to reduce emissions, okay? Banking, we can use digital technology in banks. I mean, here the opportunities are huge, but specifically, you can, because you have the information about what the consumers are buying, and you can calculate the carbon footprint that they are living with those products and play with them and, and make them possible to compensate for that uh, carbon footprint. More examples, health. You know that here in Spain, we have a serious problems with elderly people. More than two million people are living alone and are over 65 years old. So we can use Internet of Things, smart speakers, to protect them, to connect them with their family. This would achieve a very good thing, and it's, it's a, a pure technological initiative. Or insurance. Insurance has to move in the impact revolution from just compensating the catastrophes that happen to preventing them. And this is an example, the micro-insurance of very poor people, people that are exposed to catastrophes created by climate changes, you can just offer them a, a low-cost insurance and, of, and work especially to prevent that from happening. Why? Because, or how? Because they all have, I already told you, their mobile phone. If you alert them or things of catastrophes, of prevention measures, before that happens, you would help them to, 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 to avoid the catastrophe and you would not even have to compensate them. Same idea in health, reducing the cost of insurance by rewarding somehow 
to the people who are promoting health habits. So again, you are not only compensating if something happens, but preventing that that bad thing happens. Or energy, it's easy to think on using technology to calculate the environmental impact of my energy plants, of everything at the beginning of a manufacturing process, and use for that artificial intelligence, of course, even satellite imagery to try to make a better world. So I hope you got some ideas, about, uh, which are general ideas still, but if some of you still think that this is not possible, just dedicate a couple of minutes to see what other people with names and surnames are doing around the world. Sound? No sound? Well, this can be read. So I promised you a tale of real world heroes with a twist at the end, and here comes the twist. As Albert Einstein said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And every one of you sitting here has the privilege to know and has the duty to act. So it is the time, the twist is that you are the real world hero, so please join the impact revolution. Please make Steve Jobs, Tim Berners-Lee, and so many, many people that place their faith in technology make them proud. Please go out there and save the world. Thank you.
everybody we have, and thank you very much, Jose. We have a few minutes for questions, so I can't see anything out there because of the lights. So if you have a question uh, for Jose about his talk, can you uh, raise your hand, please? And Fatima is out there somewhere with a microphone. We have a, oh, I, could, I just cover the light, look. Artificial intelligence. Uh, <laughs> here's a question here. Um, here the microphone is coming. Hola, buenos días y muchísimas gracias. Tengo una pregunta acerca de una de las iniciativas que aparece en varios de los slides, que es la de trazar la huella de carbón de los productos orientado un poco pues, a productos de consumo como la alimentación. ¿no? Que había una iniciativa que se llamaba Provenas, me ha parecido ver. Sí. Y es un campo que he estado también investigando un poco, viendo las diferentes ISOs y regulación al respecto, pero he visto mucha barrera por parte de las compañías, como que no lo ponen fácil no se alinean con esta iniciativa de intentar de ser conscientes del impacto, ¿no? Si habéis trabajado vosotros al respecto, ¿habéis, bueno, ¿lo, ¿lo tienes algo avanzado? ¿Habéis podido saltar esa barrera y conseguir la colaboración de los productores? Yeah. Uh, the, the issue about the provenance use case, if, if you study it a little more, for example, you can go over to our booth and we will tell you more about this, is that it's a very deep connected project because it, it, it has to, to go to the source of the supply chain. So, of course, it has to, to make a lot of people in agreement about getting the product done. If you notice, when I, I talk about ideas, practical ideas to start now, I, I wasn't as ambitious as this. I, also, I only talked about informing the user about the carbon footprint, but not about really checking that the origin of these products is in uh, biological, ecological, I mean, ecological fish, or, or not, I, I mean, not from poor areas in the world that are not uh, treated correctly. I mean, that's what provenance tries to do, but you're right. It, it requires to have a lot of people in agreement because blockchain is like that, and right now are at the very beginning of the impact revolution, and not everybody is easy to come on board. So that. That, I mean, is a very good idea, and in, in mid-term it will be feasible, but right now it's, it's not the easiest place to start, I agree. Any more questions out there? Raise your hand. I have a question, Jose. Uh, have you had a resistance from clients that you've been working with about uh, having a more, you know, putting impact into the products that you're building with them? And if you have, how have you managed that resistance or help them see the benefits? No, actually, I mean, uh, we are a little, uh, not surprised, but, but encouraged for, by the response of our, our clients. I mean, most, mo uh, many of them, if not most, are, are already aware of this shift in society that it's moving them into the new impact revolution. So they are willing to do that. The problem that they have is what I try to outline is how to do that. So that's where we come in to try to, to move them from an initiative that is at the PowerPoint level, that CEO level, to, to try to get that down to a real impact, to real digital products that help them to be consequent to that initiative that many of them, if not most, are already interiorizing. Thank you. We have a question over here, Fatima. Um, just in the middle, if you raise your hand again. There it is. Um, very good presentation, Jose. Um, Thank you. This is an easy question. In a world where uh, economy and business rewards growth, and profit, how you make social, environmental, et cetera, impact compatible with this economy? So the, the, the thing is that it naturally is compatible. In fact, it's what I try to, to transmit because uh, there are many companies that think that they have to choose. Either I am profitable, I grow, or I are, are good for my investors, or I am responsible, I do good in the world. But the thing is that in the impact revolution, that is no longer true. I mean, there are two movements that are on par. If you are responsible with the world, you will have more profit, you will have more revenue, because your clients, your investors, 
your workers are going to choose you over the competition. So in fact, it's the other way around. In a few years, the ones that do not do this, who are not socially responsible, are the ones to, who will start to go into trouble in terms of profitability and revenues. That's the thing. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few more questions, if anybody has them, uh, because our next speaker, Paco Nathan, is running a couple of minutes late. So raise your hand. I will, try. <laughs> I will cover all the lights. I think we have one down here. Keep your hand up so Fatima can see you, and she'll bring the microphone over. Uh, there it is. For those who are arriving now, we're just running a, a few minutes late. Our next speaker, Paco, uh, who's going to be speaking about data governance, is uh, due, to, due to arrive in about seven minutes. So we'll start in about seven minutes, the next talk. But we're going to take the time to answer questions if there are some. So take it away. Hi. Uh, more than a question is to say thank you. Because for the most of us, um, that we have um, some knowledge uh, about the technologies, about the new processes that we are improving the world. Sometimes we don't have access to the information about the companies who are trying to change the world, actually. Uh, we don't have access to uh, sometimes um, talent program to reach those companies, to reach those human resources department. Or uh, there's, there's a, it's, it's getting difficult to mm -hmm. recognize which company is actually doing something good and it, it, it is not just uh, marketing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I just want to say thank you. Okay, so you, you are very welcome and if you want to join the, the revolution, you can stop by our booth outside and get more information about us and about everybody else that, that it's also sharing this view about the impact. Any more questions for Jose? because I have another one oh. <laughs> while, while we have time here. Uh, if somebody in their company would like, you know, is feeling like they want to make an impact, uh, but they need to convince their boss, how might they go about that? I mean, the thing is that in Paradigma, we don't really have the classical hierarchical structure with bosses that stop things from happening. I mean. If you have an idea, being it an impact-driven idea or whatever thing that you want to propose, you have a lot of channels in Paradigma to transmit it, to convey it, to, so that it reaches the people that, that could make it happen, which can start by yourself, but if you need help, that in Paradigma is going to happen for sure. But especially in Paradigma, we have no problem at all accepting and, and even driving those kind of ideas because as, as I try to, to explain, it's our purpose. I mean, we have probably more problems with other initiatives that can be good, but we don't have the time or the focus to approach. But in impact-driven initiatives, I mean, our whole focus is right out there. And anybody who has an idea in Paradigma about this is going to be listened. Perfect. Thank you. Well, if, unless there's other questions, and I don't see any, uh, I'll take one last check. Well, let's thank you again. Thank you to Jose Ruiz. <laughs>